Well, welcome everyone. I'm Alison from the Southern Cross Postgraduate Association. A big warm welcome to you all. It's a bit wet and rainy here in Lismore. Um, so we are recording the workshop and it will be posted to our uh, YouTube channel and I'll post the link in the chat box. Um, so I just ask everyone to just put their mics on mute once we get going. Um, and also to become, I encourage you all to become a member of the Postgraduate Association and I'll put those links in the chat box for you. So um, today is writing an excellent literature review and it has created a lot of interest. So um, I'll hand it over to you, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alison. And look, good morning, everyone. It's it's wonderful to be with you all. And uh, I was just saying to Alison and Craig before I prepared too many slides, but that's better than too few slides. <laughs> so we'll we'll just play it by ear in terms of uh, Alison and I were saying that please just to encourage you. Uh, as Alison is already doing, to use the chat function to put in comments, questions as we go, and so on. Um, and um, But perhaps we'll save the discussion until the end. Uh, also, I'm very, uh, I know that some people will have to leave on the dot of 11 a.m. today or um, uh, Eastern Standard Time and so on. That's absolutely fine. Depending, of course, on on the discussion, it may be that everything's petered out by then, which is fine. On the other hand, if uh, if anyone wants to stay uh, after 11, I'm certainly happy to do that. We'll just see how we get on. So uh, as Alison has indicated, the topic is writing an excellent literature review. And Alison very kindly shared with me some of the, the, the well, the diverse disciplines and so on that people are working on. Uh, and coming to this topic from. So that's absolutely terrific. And I also understand, of course, that uh, people, uh, some of you may, your literature review might be a glimmer in the eye, whereas the others, you might well have mastered it and uh, toss excellent literature reviews off in the blink of an eye, maybe even when you're sleeping, which is fantastic. <laughs> but I'm hoping that there'll be something for everyone and also the opportunity to share, particularly towards the end of the presentation. All right. So in terms of the acknowledgement of country, uh, that's an image from Gumanguru Aboriginal Historical Site. And uh, Vincent, I know, is in Toowoomba. Other people might well have visited here. That's north, north of the city of Toowoomba. Um, so certainly on behalf of Empowering Editing, I would like, or we at Empowering Editing, and I know all of you, acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. And for myself, that's the Jagara, Gaibal and Jawa people of the Toowoomba region where I'm located and Vincent is located, and maybe others are located as well. And we certainly pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. So in terms of the overview of the presentation, please don't be alarmed about the number of topics. Uh, some of these are single slide topics or two slides and so on. But I did want to do a, a little bit of a preview because, as we know, for almost all disciplines, maybe all disciplines, the literature review is one of the non-negotiable elements. And so all of us, or very or nearly all of us, would be writing literature reviews. But as I'll get to in a moment, there's a fair degree of variability in the shape and size and contribution to the yeah, overall yeah, yeah. thesis of the literature review and so on. So what that means is that people have different ways of approaching the literature review. And so I just, uh, so for instance, I notice on the association's excellent YouTube site, Alison kindly shared with me, there's a really excellent <laughs> uh, preparing literature review uh, presentation from the point of view of uh, systematic literature review from a librarian. And that's terrific and really important. But of course, um, uh, and so that's drawing on that person's specialist knowledge. This might seem it may, maybe not, a little bit idiosyncratic. But when I was putting this together over the weekend, I was thinking about, for me, these are some of the starting points for writing a, a really good literature review, but they're also timely reminders for us to go back to again and again. So that's the, uh, the 
like the rationale underlying this sequencing of topics and so on. So I will have a, a thought, only a brief thought about the word excellent. Really important to have a note of encouragement about doing this. Uh, section seven, a scholarly voice as the centerpiece of the literature review is probably the centerpiece of the presentation as well. I see that as the as the starting point and the finishing line, actually, of the of the literature review and also of the thesis itself. I do have a word about word count because that is a very pragmatic consideration. And then I'll, I'll deal with at least some of these, some tensions to navigate, the difference between contextual and conceptual frameworks, points of alignment, a word of caution about this notion of filling the gap. And sometimes we hear that in terms of writing the literature review. Uh, and then three quite different but complementary strategies for communicating your scholarly voice in the literature review and then uh, some concluding um, encouragement. So I really do thank Alison, who's just been so friendly and encouraging and welcoming and so on on behalf of the association. I congratulate the association. Uh, Alison and Craig were sharing it's been going for 12 years, which is really important. I've worked in two universities and um, the, the, their equivalent of these postgraduate association came and went, sadly. So it's really lovely to see that continuity. And I thank all of you and I wish all of you well. All right, a couple of crucial caveats and also a note. So as I was saying, there are many equally legitimate ways that you can think about researching, structuring and writing your literature review. Uh, and that's a really important reminder because sometimes people, particularly when they're starting, uh, might have a view that it's predetermined or that it's already existing and it, your role is to discover this mysterious thing. That's not the case at all. You're crafting something new, something that does not exist. And so those of you who have used uh, or are using classical grounded theory, for instance, as we know, um, the idea there is that the literature review is almost the last thing that you write after you collect the data and do the data analysis and so on. That's unusual. Usually, as we know, it's at the front end of the thesis, but it's a timely reminder that um, there are different ways of approaching this. Also, really importantly, nothing in this workshop is intended to challenge or to contest or undermine or anything like that, your supervisor's advice, experience and knowledge. And so clearly working with them. So if I say anything here today that's different from what you've discussed with them, the, you know, say well, Patrick said this, what do you think? Is he, uh, you know, is he off the planet or is it worth considering? Uh, and just a few of these slides I did use in a previous presentation. All right, so just a, uh, very quick about myself. I did work for many years at Central Queensland University, and then I went to the University of Southern Queensland in 2005. I retired from there in 2023. Since then, I've been working 60% at Excelsior College in Sydney, but as a remote worker, I've never actually been to the campus there yet. I've had the pleasure of co-supervising 55 doctoral students to graduation and two others are currently engaging with their examiners feedback. I've also examined 41 doctoral theses. Um, so that's not me showing off or more pro accurately showing how old I am. That's more about saying that I've had the experience of working with people in very different approaches to the literature review. I'm a qualitative researcher, so at the moment I'm teaching a mixed methods unit and I go very quickly over the quant and there's someone else who has a quant background and he, he, he um, smooths over all, their all the students' confusion on that part of things. Um, I really enjoy researching education research in a broad sense, sociology of education, rural education, related topics and so on. All right, so this was the abstract that I sent through to Alison and, and she's kindly shared with people. So just starting with three important questions. How can we recognize an excellent literature review when we read it? And what that relates to fundamentally is the really important point of judgment. And so one of the usually um, incidental implicit skills or attributes or dispositions of 
HDR study is developing judgment, scholarly judgment. And it's really exciting uh, when people do have that judgment and they can use that. Uh, um, so one answer to that question is an excellent literature review would demonstrate the, uh, the scholars or the researchers or the research students scholarly judgment. We'll come to evidence of that shortly, but it's something to bear in mind. Um, it also relates to scholarly voice, which we'll also come to. How can we work towards writing an excellent literature review? And I do have a few strategies towards the end of the presentation that are some examples of strategies that work. And then principles and practices and so on to ensure that it's fit for purpose and speaks with authenticity and authority to multiple stakeholders and diverse audiences. So that's something else to, to bear in mind as we're writing the literature review. Who are Who is the audience? Or sometimes who are the multiple audiences? Who are the stakeholders in reading this? And sometimes, of course, we need to employ different strategies uh, to speak to those different multiple audiences. So it can be quite complex. And so hopefully, uh, You'll be the judge of that, of course, each of you, but hopefully there'll be some useful ideas and actionable strategies to help everyone to work towards literature reviews that are both effective and excellent. Now, a thought about the word excellent. Um, so I, I'm using it really, this term excellent in terms of literature review, I guess in the colloquial everyday sense of high quality, first class and so on. Um, I do... Uh, uh, believe strongly that what excellent means in this context is that it's demonstrated and consistent effectiveness and fitness for purpose. For, so part of that is being really clear, obviously, about the purpose of your literature review. What, what role, where does it occur in the thesis? What role, what function does it perform in the thesis? And uh, how can you signpost that and so on? Um, so, um, we, we need to recognize and acknowledge that there are, imp there are limitations on the literature review, particularly the word count and, um, and in terms of the overall word count, which I'll come to shortly, but also in terms of our knowledge. So um, I believe that that's important to recognize in setting the boundaries around the literature review, that inevitably there are limitations of that. This is in focus, that's out of focus. But even within what's in focus, it's not laying claims to saying that you have read every single paper. Um, when when I did my doctorate, it was, which was more than, well, 25 years ago now, I guess, um, you know, that was pre-internet and all of that kind of thing. So obviously we had access to databases, but it was a different world. So in a sense, we've had this efflorescence or um, proliferation of knowledge and information and so on. And so that can be incredibly exciting and so on, but it can put extra pressures on researchers. So rather than um, absorbing that and putting even more pressure on yourself, I think it's a matter of being realistic and rec and so on. Now, a note of encouragement, and some of you might have come across this paper before. I really like this, particularly the title. It's a PhD, not a Nobel Prize. And then the subtitle is How Experienced Examiners Assess Research Theses. Um, and um, um, the authors did a really interesting study. I don't think they've done an updated version. So this was 2002. And basically what they did was that they interviewed a, a fairly large number of PhD thesis examiners. And uh, the, I really liked the way, um, because I've, I'm not sure about Mullins, but I've seen Kylie at a conference and she's very engaging and very supportive of students and so on. And so uh, I think it's nice that they've written this. The most heartening information is that experienced examiners want the students to be awarded the PhD or the uh, equivalent award and will go <laughs> sometimes to extraordinary lengths to enable this to happen. And so sometimes it's uh, examiners saying, well, I'm not exactly clear on this point, but I think what's happening is here. So, uh, and I do that myself. And the other exam, the people I know, colleagues who are examiners also do that. Um, I guess we start 
from the from the standpoint that the student has gone through all of the checks and balances of confirmation of candidature, usually ethics approval, the, the regular progress reports, often an internal check before it goes out for external examination. And so I, I certainly have a pre-judgment that, that that it's going to pass. It may pass with uh, revisions of varying degrees of minor, major, etc. But that's the starting point. And so I think it's really important to think about that, about the thesis as a whole, but also about the literature review. And hopefully that will relieve the pressure that often HDR students put on themselves. This has got to be the definitive version of, of the literature review about this topic. Um, and it's good if you can do that, but I, I think it should be reframed somewhat to take the, to reduce the pressure. Um, and so I've certainly found this no disrespect at all to uh, people who are newly minted doc doctors and, you know, really want to get their first examination and so on. But what I've found is that people who, uh, on the face of it, a uh, bit of a stereotype, or oh, they're, you know, jaded and uh, cynical and so on, actually, they very often, occasionally I've got it wrong, but very often they come back and say, look, this is, a, this is a very good piece of work because they're genuinely interested in seeing what's the latest thinking in the field. And, and that's partly what the literature re review is about, of course. And so I also like this. So I think the details of this was that these were supervisors. Um, and so this was someone female working in maths English, which is an interesting combination. A PhD is a stepping stone to a research career. All you need to do is to demonstrate your capacity for independent critical thinking. That's all you need to do. A PhD is three years or sometimes longer of solid work, not a Nobel Prize. So um, I would just take that note of encouragement and go back to it regularly for the thesis as a whole, and for your literature review, uh, so to help you to keep that in perspective. And also, some of you might know this already, but I think this is a really interesting uh, research centre at the University of Newcastle in, um, in Australia, so uh, just down the road from SCU, I think. So the study of research training and impact and so on. Alison Holbrook is the director currently of that. And so this was Kylie writing a, a later paper. I didn't have a clue what they were talking about, PhD candidates and theory. I presume that's a student's statement, but it could have been a supervisor or so an examiner's statement, I'm not sure. Um, anyway, and, I, and doctoral candidates as learners and examiner reference to theory in PhD theses. So it's really interesting that people, and this has been going for some time, and I've heard these colleagues present at conferences. So it's really good that they're looking at this work uh, and quite likely they've written about and um, literature reviews as well. All right, as I mentioned at the outset, I see this as the centerpiece of the literature review and also of this presentation. And so this notion of developing a scholarly voice. Now, it's one of those things where if you go into a shop and say, I'd like a scholarly voice, please, <laughs> you won't get one. Um, a couple of my students have become a little bit tetchy with me when I've talked about this because they've said, what are you talking about? Where is it? Where can I get one? What does it look like? And so on. And then when I've uh, explain, responded, well, it's very elusive and slippery, a bit like a mirage in the desert, but you'll know it when you find it. Um, sometimes they get annoyed with me for saying it like that. But what it is really is thinking about what do you think about this intellectual field that you're working in? What are you, how do you judge it, J judgment again? Um, what do you see as the strengths? What do you see as the gaps? What do you see as its contribution to the wider world? Why should people care about it? Uh, more broad, you know, more broadly, and why should people care about your research as part of that, and so on. Now, um, I, I think it would be impossible, or certainly very difficult, for people to have that view at the start of the study. Of course, you might have been thinking about it for a long time as a practitioner or a policymaker or whatever, uh, and that's great. But I just really want to highlight that it takes extended time and effort. This is not something that can be done overnight. It's something that um, 
it's it's in many ways it's a mysterious process but it's got dashes of insight dashes of inspiration and sometimes i thought of this as accidental connections which may not make a lot of sense but sometimes when we're thinking about things doing yoga or pilates or other kinds of body stretching exercises something happens to the mind and you think ah that's connected to that or that could speak to that and it's fascinating how that process works or you might be walking along the beach or you might be doing the grocery shopping or whatever it might be um, I would go with those moments because uh, time and time again they have yielded really interesting insights and and things that are worthwhile it's definitely attainable persistence certainly does pay off now a real life example so Rosie's Coffee Shop, Central Queensland University, Rockhampton Campus, one Monday morning, I was working with Teresa, who was looking at uh, four academic women and their work and identity. This was um, early 2000s. And so every Monday morning, Rosie and I would meet at, uh, sorry, <laughs> Teresa and I would meet at Rosie's Coffee Shop. And we took it in turns as to who was to buy the coffee and so on. And I well remember one Monday morning, I don't remember the date, but I remember saying to uh, Teresa, I'm buying the coffee, Teresa. Congratulations, you found your scholarly voice. It was a eureka moment because what had happened before then was that this was partly the literature review and partly the data analysis. Until that point, Teresa had deferred to Judith Butler and all of the other feminist post-structuralists uh, authority she was citing and so she would write Butler wrote this and someone else wrote that and all of that kind of thing and I would say hopefully nicely well that's great but what do you think where, where, where what do you, how do you stand on that or where do you stand on that or is that how does that relate to uh, that university in the early 2000s given that some of these people were writing you know in the United States in the 80s and 90s and so on and I don't know what it was um, and it sure, I'm sure it wasn't me badgering her, but something clicked. And the weekend just before this Monday morning, I was reading uh, Teresa's voice. I was no longer reading their voice. So what they were still there, but they'd moved from the foreground to the background. And Teresa's voice had taken centre stage. And of course, she was still collegial and respectful and engaged. Uh, the, all those other lovely attributes of scholarly uh, disposition, disposition at its best. And so uh, I, I still remember that many, many years later, decades later. So as I say, this is variable. People's scholarly voices are expressed and articulated in a really variable, uh, lots of different ways. And I have a few strategies to think about for communicating your voice shortly. And of course, you may well be doing this already, which is great. Now, a word about word count. Now, um, I, my apologies if you can't read the numbers, but the actual numbers are not really important. So I should update this, but this is eight people's doctoral theses from many years ago. I'm H, and I can't, uh, I do know who the others are, but I just gave them letters to fit it on one screen. And so what this is, is their word count for the literature review, and the literature review is a proportion of the total thesis word count. And so if we just look at the this row, the literature review row, C, I oh know, um, F and G, their literature reviews were 7761 and 7913 total. Okay, but F had a, a smaller literature review and a conceptual framework that was um, I can't count, as I said before, a lot bigger. So that was 24,000 words for the conceptual framework for F. For uh, G, it was only a little bit bigger. So they, they were the smallest, and then 9,500, and then 12,500, uh, almost 16,500, oh, 16 17,000, um, 18,500. Mine was kind of in the middle, I guess, just over 15,000 words. 
but then I had 25,000 words for my conceptual framework. And my lovely supervisor said, look, Patrick, don't write any more. It's good that you've got that. No one will probably read that, but it's good that you've spent that time working on that because that's kept you happy and out of mischief and so on. So that was lovely. Now, if we look at the proportion of the literature review as the total word count, uh, we've got just on 9%, just over 9%, uh, 15 Oh, sorry, 12, 15%, I was 14, nearly 14 and a half, uh, 18 and 19%. So in other words, from 9% to nearly 20%. Now, um, it may look as though I'm obsessed with word counts. I'm not really, but I do think that it's a, a pragmatic consideration as to how long your literature re review will be as part of the thesis itself. This was in the days when the usual word count for PhD theses was 100,000 words. Then, I'm not sure about uh, Southern Cross, but USQ decided, oh, examiner fatigue, we can't get examiners, we'll reduce the word count to 80%, uh, uh, to 80,000 words. And they even got to the point of actually saying you had to have a special dispensation if it was one word over 80,000. Then sanity prevailed and it's kind of recalibrated. So now people do have uh, particularly qualitative theses over 80,000, and it's kind of gone back up again towards the 100,000. Um, so as I say, I'm not obsessed by that, but it is a practical consideration. So um, there. Um, uh, so Alexandra, that's a good question about proportions. Sorry if I'm distracted by that, but uh, in the moment, uh, yes, I think so. I, I do think so. So it's proportionate of, you know, however long your honours thesis is, whether that's 30,000, um, 40,000, whatever. And of course, research masters, typically half of the PhD thesis length. So that might be 40,000, 50,000. So generally in proportion. Thanks. Okay. So now these are some tensions to navigate that follow from that very pragmatic point about word count. And one of these is being comprehensive being, uh, versus being proportionate. And related to that is breadth versus depth. And again, I don't know what your supervisors and your you think and your fellow students think and so on. I tend to view, I, I certainly say to my students, you will encounter this breadth versus depth uh, dilemma. And almost always, maybe I should temper that a bit, um, very often, depth wins. So I'm sure you've heard that. I can only think of it in the old imperial measures, an inch wide and a mile deep. So whatever that is in metric. But in other words, uh, you're really focused in an in-depth study. Now, I was talking to a new student the other day, and I said, that's my general experience. If you, with the, that student, wanted to have two sites for the research. And I said, if you want to do that, you could go for more breadth as long as you understand that there's less depth, you know, because you can't exceed the word count um, with a margin of error and that kind of thing. So, and that would um, have some implications too for the uh, literature review, because uh, I'll come to alignment shortly, but it's really important that there is that alignment between the literature review, say, and the research questions and the data analysis. So, um, and also this notion of seminal text versus contemporary texts and so on. So in the field that you're in, you, of course, make the judgment who is seminal. You know, there'd probably be lots of people auditioning to be in your thesis. I want to be in your thesis. I want to be in your thesis. You decide who is seminal. And, and also in terms of contemporary, lots of candidates, but you decide how those candidates and um, how, how those candidates uh, sorry, those candidates' contemporary works, which of those are significant enough to include? Um, but a very pragmatic strategy, particularly if you're towards the end of your thesis writing, is to have a quick look through your references and to see how many of those are post-2020, and particularly at the moment, how many of those are in published in 20, 2023, 2024, Okay. Um, now, a textual strategy is signposting, and that that's so important. But it's one of these things that we often 
know about it when it's not there as readers. And so it's really important as the writer, as the author, as the person navigating, that you have these signposts to say, as I mentioned before, this is what's in scope of this study and therefore of this literature review, this everything else by definition is out of scope. And you have a, 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 you know, a justification for that. It's not purely arbitrary and random and so on. All right, so if, uh, if we're moving now to the distinction between contextual and conceptual frameworks. Now, uh, the point that Alison was making before, which is really important about the diversity of your discipline. So in some, some disciplines, you won't actually talk about or write about conceptual frameworks. You might write about paradigm or you might write about theoretical framework or other kinds of analytical framework, or you might not uh, you might not write that at all. If it's, uh, you know, using statistics, uh, you would still, it would still be very rigorous, but you may not use those words. But for those of us who do have this, uh, I think it is useful for the literature review to think of it as the contextual framework for your study. Now, often, not always, but often, the literature review is chapter two, and in this uh, framework, not in every framework, but in this in this one, generic structure for the thesis, the conceptual framework is often chapter three. So they appear one after the other. And so if we think about the literature review as contextualizing the study, setting the boundaries around it, what knowledge exists already, that helps us to select a conceptual frame, to distinguish rather, between that contextual framework and a conceptual framework. And so if we think about it, there might be three people working in the same intellectual field, which might be mental health nursing, or it might be teacher work and identity, uh, or it might be some aspect of rural sociology. So I don't know, um, constructions of place in rural environments or, or whatever. And so from that point of view, Presumably, they're, they're, and, and they're working, you know, I was thinking they might be working in a broader research team. And if that were the case, they would clearly have different research questions, or most likely have different research questions. They'd be very likely to have different conceptual frameworks, although they might share some aspect of Bourdieu or Foucault or De Sato or Bakhtin or, or Judith Butler or whoever it might be. Um, and um, they would have some, I think, they would have, if they're working in the same intellectual field, they would have some convergences re regarding the literature review. But, and this is, I guess, the key point I want to make, they would also, being conscious that there are two other people in the same lab or research team working in the same general area, they would be uh, careful to differentiate their literature review. So they might have a blend. They might have the same things might be a recent government report or policy document that everyone's talking about at the moment, but they would have presumably different takes on that shared document, for instance. But they would also have some other different literature that reflects the specificity of what they're looking at. So all of this is good uh, because it helps you to set your boundaries around what you're doing and to ensure that you know, that it's feasible and that um, uh, that it can work for you. So, as I say, for me, it doesn't always work, but it can be useful to think about the literature review as a contextual framework that complements your conceptual framework. Um, and this is your judgment. Um, and also, this is a really important point. Occasionally, I've seen examiners who are exceptions to that, and they say, oh, you haven't cited this seminal work in your thesis, which is usually their seminal work. And so when you get the examiner's reports, that's easy. You just find five or six recent references to their work. But that's actually, despite what we might think about thesis examiners, that's fairly rare. More often, examiners are actually interested. So what what is your the student's take on the literature? You know, um, Often it's a it's a not a lazy way, but it can be a good way. I haven't looked at that literature for some time. Here's someone who's just submitted a thesis about it. What what's their take on it? And so, 
I really like that collegial fellow scholar kind of disposition uh, that, that, you know, that people, uh, most examiners do demonstrate and so on, rather than the literature as being predetermined. Because sometimes, pe sometimes students become almost um, frozen. I don't know if it's fear or nervousness or anxiety. I haven't, what about, what happens if I haven't quoted this other thing, this seminal work and so on? Um, well, I say, well, if you haven't found it, maybe other people haven't found it either. How do we know that it even exists? So uh, obviously, you know, be uh, conscientious and so on, but um, it's about being um, proportionate with regard to the literature review and so on. Okay. Now, in terms of points of alignment, just quickly about this, um, your literature review, like other parts of the thesis, do need a scholarly voice. They need your uh, analysis and judgment capacity being demonstrated and the literature review does have to align, align explicitly with your research questions or maybe your hypotheses, your conceptual framework, your data analysis, among other sections of the thesis. Now, uh, some of you may have come across Pat Thompson, who's uh, Australian, but at the um, she's in Manchester. I've visited her. That I'm sure it's Manchester. Um, no, <laughs> Nottingham. Nothing. Like, sheriff. Sheriff of. Um, sheriff of not. So Nottingham, not at Manchester at all. But and she writes this wonderful blog site called Patter. P a w t e r. She's very experienced. She's very human. She has excellent sage advice about all kinds of things related to conducting research, writing the thesis, etc. So if you know Pat, she's you know, she says what she thinks, which is great. She's very direct. So for her, I think she got tired of people talking about the gap in the research. Now, in saying this, as I say, I'm not um, I'm not being disrespectful for people who talk about this, and I have used this with my own students. But what Pat's point is that you just have to be careful about this notion of filling the gap in current knowledge. So what she says here is that the notion of the gap actually overstates the reality of most disciplines. Most of us work in occupied spaces where there's already a lot of research activity going on. So the notion that there is a gap waiting for us with, with our name on is actually, uh, from Pat's point of view, um, not deceptive, but it's misleading. That's the word, it's misleading. So in other words, people might be looking for something that's not actually there. Where, where you are working in a big space, for instance, the, um, the, the debates about teaching reading in education that have gone on for decades, or probably centuries, and are likely con to continue like that. It's actually quite difficult initially to say where, what your niche is, where you fit, and how you can uh, differentiate that. Um, but you will get there. So where you're working in a big space, it's unlikely that one researcher and or one research project will fill that gap, will, will fill that space. Uh, so it might be really big. On the other hand, it might be really cluttered and so on. So there are different ways that she thinks are better to think about that. So um, I don't think she made up that acronym. I think it exists. CARS, Create a Research Space. It's based on a form of knowledge that's additive and potentially competitive that, I, that I've added there. So in other words, uh, it's a very rational and rationalist form of knowledge that, and that it, it assumes that knowledge is stable. It, it, it exists there. You're going along to add to it and it's continually being added to and so on. Whereas Pat has done work, really interesting work about notions about knowledge being much more fluid than that much more contested, far less consensual, uh, far less um, accepted, uh, commonly accepted, all of that kind of thing. Um, so, and she also says, typical Pat fashion, uh, fashion, it's a timid notion. It doesn't offer the possibility of identifying problems in existing knowledge traditions or of reframing questions which open up new directions. And I think that's actually quite important to think about maybe for your study particularly if you're th finding it difficult to find a, you know, a niche for yourself. So rather than, in, in, from that point of view, rather than necessarily thinking about uh, filling the gap, it may be, all right, so um, 
this, this research has been going on for a while. Let's have a look and see if it's fit for purpose. What other um, aspects of the fields in which it operates have changed since then? What kinds of new directions or new questions or reframing existing questions might be useful? And she also makes the point, <laughs> maybe there are gaps for a good reason. Maybe they're uninteresting. Maybe they're not significant. Maybe we shouldn't waste our time on them. All right. Um, so now I'm getting into strategies for communicating your scholarly voice. And I've got three of these. And so the first one of these is moving beyond the listing of authors. Now, none of this has uh, is intended to be disrespectful to you, to your supervisors, to anyone else. And my experience, this is certainly my own uh, case when I'm writing a literature review, most people do start with the listing of authors. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, author one said this, author five said that, et cetera, et cetera. It's often the starting point. Now, as I've indicated there, I've never made a rock music single in my life, and I don't think that I ever will, but I really like the uh, the idea that thinking about the literature review is adding different layers. So in that case, it might be the percussion, the backing vocals and so on. So, and another way to think about that is a staged approach to writing the literature review. And often the first stage after you, uh, uh, you know, identify what the field is and so on, often the first stage is just going in there and saying, who's who? Who are the key players? Who's writing in this field? What are they writing about? And so um, some people have, you know, use Excel or use Gantt charts or uh, use um, the the referencing tool, uh, the software that many people use and so on. Um, there are some amazing packages there that help you to keep control of this rather than having filing cabinets spilling out with papers with printouts and you know um, not that there's anything wrong with that that's the way I tend to do things so differently colored highlighting pens and so on the danger is I know I read something it was just what I need where is it um, anyway so um, but you do need to get to the point where you move beyond listing authors as your way of organizing your literature review or structuring it to what are ideas, what are debates, what are themes. Uh, uh, no doubt there are other ways of organizing or structuring your literature review as well that work really well for you. And so as supervisors, when we're giving feedback to students, I would expect that my students would start here. But fairly soon into it, the feedback from the other supervisor and myself would be along the lines of, are there any connections with these people? Are there any points of dissonance or tension that you can, um, you know, that you can identify? Sometimes people write papers in such, <laughs> they're gifts for students, research students, because they actually write in the abstract. This paper contributes to this debate in this scholarly field in this way. And that's wonderful, but mostly people don't write that. So you have to infer, you have to make those connections yourself. And even if they do write that, of course, you may you may disagree. You know, you may say, well, actually, I know what they're talking about, but I think the underlying debate is actually about this, not about that. And that's a good sign as, as well. Not that you're just being contrary. It's a sign that your scholarly development, is, um, voice and judgment are developing well. So one example of moving beyond the listing of authors, this is from Mark Tyler. Uh, his PhD was about critical spirit in TAFE teachers in Queensland. He's now working at um, Griffith University in Brisbane. And I had the pleasure of working with Mark. So just uh, sorry about the preponderance of text, but it's really more about getting the idea. So a post-structuralist view of identity, Barber, Butler, Foucault, and so on, moves away from identity formation as either an individual or a social process. It emphasizes the political context in which identity formation occurs. So just in that one paragraph, Mark is clearly signaling his scholarly voice. He's in control of this material. Um, these very eminent and well-known thinkers and so on are there, and they're coming along for the ride and they're supporting his journey, but they're in the background. He is in the center. So that's his take on these, um, 
notions around identity. And then he applied that to literature review about TAFE teachers and so on. So the notion of multiple, multiple subjectivities rather than unchanging singularity and so on. An individual's experience interacting with their meaning making within a discourse and so on. And then self-knowledge, which he was very interested in, to develop his concept, which he drew on from other people too, of critical spirit. So he was interested, where does critical spirit come from? One of the sources is self-knowledge. So self-knowledge in turn comes from individuals interrogating their experience where narratives of subjectivity meet the narratives of culture and so on. So I'm sure that for many of you, those theorists would be very familiar. That may well be, you may think, well, almost that's stating the obvious. And, and actually, if so, that's a good thing because that's a recognition of the field that Mark was working in and so on. So um, now the second, so that's moving from uh, structuring your literature review by list, uh, listing authors to clustering it in a really coherent, well-signposted way. A second strategy is mapping an intellectual field. And so who are the key players? How are they clustered? What are the points of consensus and dissension? What are the key debates? How are those debates, where do those debates come from? How are they influenced by different paradigms, policy assumptions, other forms of research or positioning and so on. And the last one is what metaphors can be helpful in mapping the intellectual field. Now, you don't have to use a metaphor at all, but, excuse me, I was influenced by uh, someone I still regard as an, an amazing role model intellectually and so on from when I was a very young and green undergraduate decades ago. And in one of his books, he had used a... Uh, a similar kind of metaphor. So I thought I can use something like that. So many years ago, I was at a seminar. Uh, so my research centrally is about occupationally mobile communities, particularly show people, circus people. Uh, in the UK, that's um, Roma, or and in continental Europe, that's Roma, gypsy travellers. In the US, that's carnies, carnival workers, and also migrant workers, fruit pickers. It's an amazing area to work in. And like many areas, I stumbled into it accidentally and so on, but I'm really glad that I did. Anyway, in this paper, I used this metaphor. So I said, I referred to the field as a very large landscape painting of the schooling experiences of the children belonging to occupationally mobile communities. And that was 96. And then five years later, when I finally finished my thesis, I said, okay, let's go back to that and say, this thesis has contributed to the joining of the panels and the unveiling of the larger painting that depict the complexities and subtleties of itinerancy and traveler education. In other words, what I was trying to do was to use that metaphor inauthentically again, because I am not at all artistic, but using that metaphor or that analogy um, as a way of communicating my understanding of that intellectual field and of my intended contribution in the thesis to that intellectual field and so on. And so, um, and then I really needed, as I, I know you'd be very familiar with, I really needed to highlight, so what is my contribution? I really had to get it uh, really finely tuned. And so I said, because it delineates some of the physical and symbolic spaces of itinerancy and traveler education, which is for this particular group of people, and these are the main themes of my research questions, marginalization, resistance, and transformation. So I brought those things together in the second last paragraph of the final chapter, something like that. And then this is my conceptual framework, De Soto on tactics of consumption and Bakhtin on outsideness and creative understanding. So I thought I've got to get them in there. And then the interplay among marginalization, agency, and ambivalence. And so these, among others, are the important lessons of learning on the run. And that was my thesis title, Learning on the Run. So it's just a, um, a, a textual way of trying to, to uh, cross off several things in two paragraphs. It took me a fair time to write, but when I finished, I thought, well, that's the best I can do at this time in relation to that. And the literature review 
obviously was a crucial part of that because I had to establish in the literature review, um, you know, that I was contributing, hopefully, to a broader intellectual field. Now, I'm conscious of the time, but I would like to get this to, to this now. Some of you may well know the wonderful Professor John Hurley, who's Professor of Mental Health Nursing at Southern Cross Uni, and he's an excellent scholar. I had the privilege to work with John many years ago on his PhD, uh, which is an excellent PhD thesis. And um, the third strategy is something that John did really well. He positioned the literature review as a contextual framework to help him to set boundaries around it so that it was not, uh, you know, the people almost in some ways as a self-protective measure that we engage in to say to the examiners, um, you know, this is what this study is about. So happy to engage with feedback about this, implicitly not about what it's not about. And so he actually called his chapter two, rather than calling it the literature review, which is what I did and most people do, he called it the context of the study. And so within that, he had a pilot study, understanding the issues. He had his literature review divided into these um, sub subsections, I guess, workforce issues, nurse, nurse education and training, psychological therapies, psychological therapies and inclusive approach, and also divergent views, which is a nice John way of writing about debates within this, uh, within these psychological theory therapies, because it's, uh, as you may well know, it's a very contested field, and it still is. He was very interested, and still is, in emotional intelligence, and so he had a subsection on that in the literature review, and education and training for EI. So, just in the table of contents, or that part of his table of contents, he has signaled and signposted his positioning of his literature review as the contextual framework of his study. And then obviously he aligned that really well with all the other elements and so on. Um, and so, and then that's the rest of that. Okay, so, um, and then what he did it just to show part of the alignment, I guess, was that in the actual uh, literature review chapter within the context of psychological therapies, this is his first paragraph. And so, um, and he's saying this does not occur, these, um, this expansion of these roles does not occur in isolation. And so he wanted to make the case for looking at other things in the literature review, a wider view of connected issues and events, immense policy driven change, and consequently challenge. So that's beautifully crafted to talk about some very pragmatic issues um, and to put forward his take on those issues. All right, so I, I just want to finish there by really encouraging all of you, whatever stage you're at, whether you've, you, as I said before, you write literature reviews in your sleep and very comfortable with doing so and so, whether you, you have your literature review as a glimmer in your eye, but you're not quite sure which eye yet. It might be glimmering and everyone in between. So I certainly wish you well. Um, there are plenty of examples and exemplars of how other people have approached this task before you and really encouraging you to exercise your own judgment, developed in concert with your supervisors or all the other people in this association and so on to assist you in this process. Practice these different representational strategies because they really do work and they will certainly help you to make sure that your um, these literature review is both effective and excellent. And there's the references and that's a shameless plug for empowering editing that I work for. And that will be on the slides that I send through to uh, Alison later. So I'll stop sharing and see if anyone's still here, which is always a bit fraught. <laughs> We're all still here. Um, <laughs> um, thank you so much, Patrick. That was uh, excellent and very informative. Uh, so yeah, we do have some uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, earlier on, um, there was a question from Alexandra asking you about um, when you showed that graph of um, proportions in yeah. a thesis, would those um, proportions be roughly equivalent for honours and masters? Yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, it Alison. Is. Thanks, <laughs> Alexandra. Uh, I, I think so. I mean, there might be disciplinary differences, but I think as a, yeah. it's interesting, isn't it? There is a generic structure to a thesis. So I read someone with, someone was trying to be very post-structural and rebellious and so on and said, this is not a thesis. 
but he actually had, because the university said, thesis presented for the award of. So there's a bit of a dissonance there. There is a generic structure, that, and particularly with external examiners. And so I think it's good to play safe and so on. Yeah. Thanks, Alison. Yeah. Okay. Um, and also there was a question from Risa. Is she still here? Um, she said, what is data analysis for literature review? I'm not sure. Oh, sorry. I might have. I, I, I'm yes. not sure what that means. <laughs> yes. Sorry, Risa. And uh, sorry if I unintentionally misled you. In one way, it is absolutely true that when you do your literature review, you do engage in data analysis because you're collecting information, you're presenting it and so on. But what I was actually talking about, and it's probably better to differentiate, I, what I was trying to say was that your literature review has to align with and connect with your data analysis. So for instance, very often in the data analysis, and particularly in the discussion, as we know, people then refer back to their literature review and say, this finding in my thesis, you know, builds on the earlier work that I found in the literature from A, B, and C, or this finding um, actually contradicts or is different from these people who have gone before me in the literature review. So I so sorry, Risa, if I mis unintentionally misled you. Okay, thanks. Um, a couple of comments. Um, Craig said in science, it's often about the debate or contest of a theory mm -hmm. to be resolved. That's so, actually a really yeah. good point, yep. uh, Craig. And that reminds me of this distinction, which like all distinctions, it's a bit artificial, the distinction between theory testing and theory building. And mm -hmm. so, and, you mm -hmm. know, often we do both, but... Um, and Craig, I'm, I'm not sure if that's what you had in mind, but that's what it makes me think of. So sometimes we have a pre-existing theory and we apply it to a new context and so on. But almost always when we do that, we do feed back to the theory and hopefully add to it. That's right. Good and point, um, Craig. Um, a comment from David Clark, limitations and recommendations from papers have been really helpful for his mm, research. Good point. Yeah, Excellent yeah. point, David. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else does this. A, a couple of my students are very naughty. And so in the final chapter in the thesis, <laughs> they have put in somewhat future researchers should do this and this and this, knowing full well that they didn't do this, this and this because it's yeah. totally difficult. <laughs> so, so they're hoping someone else will come along and seize the day and do that. But uh, David, I absolutely agree with you. That's a great way to find your niche. Mm, that's right. Um, so I'll just throw it over to students now for the last few minutes. If you want to put your microphones on or contribute in the chat while we still have Patrick with us. Any comments or questions? I found the whole thing extremely useful. Thanks, uh, thank you very much, Patrick. Right. Uh, I've just finished the master's by research and I'm waiting for the examiner's uh, result. Um, I think picnic point behind you is a great place to be. Uh, certainly it's not there today. No. Um, but Thanks. Um, Thanks. I'm looking forward to getting the notes, Alison. Okay. Yep, I'll send them out. Yep. Can I, ju can I just say... i for my PhD. Oh, well, jolly good. And I don't know if that... I don't know, Vincent, is, if that is actually your office or if that's a backdrop on Zoom, but I'm very impressed. It's very scholarly. You've got all of those wonderful <laughs> machines yeah. and books and papers. Photocopier. And photocopier, <laughs> yes. Excellent. Thank you, yes, Vincent. I wish you well with it. My field of research is a little bit unique, which is why I'm having trouble with literature reviews. Ah. Uh, my literature review for my HDR uh, came up with my supervisor saying, I thought there'd be more literature than this. But I had the reply, well, I've done the search and this yeah. is all I'm coming up with once mm -hmm. I eliminated the papers because my research is in the area of hearing loss. Ah. And uh, the gap between institutional and clinical research is huge. It's an enormous divide. So it's making it a little bit difficult to link that. Mm -hmm. Because on one hand, you've got an industry which is very loath to get involved in yeah. counselling programs for obvious reasons, and yeah. yet the government is pushing them to run counselling programs uh, for their clients. But all the literature that's coming out on counselling programs is mostly academic. 
uh, and it's institutional and it's coming from America in, in a lot of cases. So on the who's who basis, once you categorise who's who, you see that the, the, the weight is towards the US. Yes. Um, and then trying to bridge that gap between what's expected in Australia and that is quite challenging. Great niche for you, Vincent. Plenty of room for you to contribute. That's wonderful. But yes, yes I wish you well with that. Any other uh, questions? Alison. Yes, Dennis. Alison, um, first of all, a comment and a question. Patrick, yeah. I appreciate very much this presentation. It's been very Thank useful you. for me. Um, overall, I appreciate you're an e exemplar of the type of academic who is very open and very supportive of people who are um, following behind you. I appreciate that very much because not all academics are like that. And I just <laughs> want to ask your question. My area in uh, my research is very controversial in my profession. It relates to um, um, a philosophical concept that is very popular within the troops in the profession, but very unpopular with the academics. Mm -hmm. And so I continually run into flack or um, opposition. Mm -hmm. When I'm, I've finished my PhD, I'm publishing, writing and publishing now, I run into opposition against getting my work published in the journals in my small mm -hmm. profession because the people who control those journals in that area just don't consider it legitimate. Mm -hmm. They want to exclude it and destroy it. Mm. Could you give me some, uh, when I go outside of the profession to try to publish, the journals say, well, this is interesting, but it doesn't re relate to our area. Could you address that problem I'm having? One, uh, and I'm sorry to hear that, Dennis. Uh, I have come across that in other respects. Just one quick thing, which you might have thought about this already. Um, in terms of getting uh, publishing in, in this kind of situation you've shared with us, one strategy could be to look for people who are putting together um, edited theme issues, special issues of journals that have some kind of connection with you and you know that you feel that you could contribute to. And pragmatically, they're often on the hunt because I've done this myself. They're on the hunt for people um, who are able to some, offer something new and distinctive and so on. And so one strategy could be to connect, to contact them. Now, um, you know, you might feel, I don't know what the connection could be or they might feel that, but it's having the initial conversation to see how you could contribute to that. So unfortunately, yes, um, you know, capitalism in, in scholarship and all of that kind of thing and gatekeepers. So one way is to think about how you can go outside those gates to contribute to a, a another field where you can actually make in many ways very distinctive contribution that does not depend on these gatekeepers. Um, there are probably other things I can think of, but that's the first thing that crosses my mind. There are, I'm sure there are people out there who would be really interested and in including the debate that you've highlighted. Thank you very much. Wish you well. Thanks, Dennis. Okay, good one. So um, just while I've got everyone here, I, I, I'll be sending out a feedback form, which is just a very brief um, form that'll take you one to two minutes. And we actually asked students what are the other areas we could tackle in workshops for you? Because we really value your feedback and um, Patrick and I have been working on what else can we deliver for you next time. But if you are happy to provide us with feedback, what you think you need a workshop on, um, please, please let us know in that feedback form. Yeah, thanks. All right. Any last questions or we'll, uh, we might... Uh, finish up.